why the U.S. Navy's secret wooden torpedoes terrified Japanese shipyards, until they saw why. In the earliest months of the Pacific War, the oceans were no longer vast blue spaces of isolation. They had become killing grounds of steel and fire. Every coastline trembled with the distant echo of naval guns, and every shipyard worked feverishly beneath the specter of annihilation. Across the Pacific, Japan's shipbuilders toiled day and night, convinced that the Empire's steel war machine would dominate the seas for generations. Yet in the midst of this industrial fury, a strange rumor began to ripple through their ranks. One that defied reason, one that would soon send shivers through every dock and harbor engineer. The Americans, they said, were using wooden torpedoes. At first, it sounded absurd. Torpedoes were meant to pierce hulls, to tear apart armor, to sink battleships in boiling plumes of oil and debris. Wood belonged to fishing boats and driftwood, not weapons of war. But when the first reports arrived from the shallow waters of the Pacific Islands, reports of wooden shapes gliding silently beneath the surface, striking targets with uncanny precision, and leaving behind wreckage without explanation, the laughter turned into uneasy silence. Japanese shipyard engineers pored over fragments recovered from wrecked ships and sunken docks, confused by the light, fibrous debris that floated on the tide. It made no sense. It seemed impossible that such a material could carry destruction. Yet what they saw next would haunt their imaginations for the rest of the war. The truth, as it later emerged, was born not from madness, but from necessity and ingenuity. When the United States Navy planned its first retaliatory raids against Japanese-occupied territories in the Pacific, it faced a problem no conventional weapon could solve. Many of Japan's most strategic targets, fuel depots, submarine pens, and aircraft factories, were not hidden deep in the mountains or buried beneath layers of fortifications. They were located along the edges of shallow harbors, shielded by coral reefs and sandbanks that made normal torpedo attacks impossible. The Navy's standard Mark 13 torpedoes were heavy steel monsters, designed for deep water runs launched from bombers or destroyers. If dropped in shallow water, they would dive straight into the seabed before ever reaching their targets. Precision bombing was unreliable. The U.S. needed something that could skim the surface, travel straight and true, and strike where no ordinary weapon could. From this dilemma emerged an idea that at first seemed ludicrous even to its creators replace the steel casing of a torpedo with wood. Engineers at the Naval Air Weapons Station in California began experimenting in secrecy, fashioning crude prototypes from laminated pine and balsa, wrapping them with waterproof coatings, and fitting them with standard propulsion and detonation systems. The wooden shell, they realized, could make the torpedo lighter and buoyant enough to skim across the surface rather than diving into the seabed. It would not sink but glide riding the thin line between air and water like a skipping stone. In testing pools and secluded coves, they watched these strange hybrid creations speed across shallow depths, their wooden bodies slicing through waves with ghostly silence. What began as a desperate improvisation quickly revealed itself as a revolutionary adaptation. By 1943, when the U.S. Navy launched its first major air raids against the Japanese fleet anchorage at Truk Lagoon, the wooden torpedo had become a classified weapon of terrifying potential. Its purpose was not to replace traditional steel torpedoes, but to extend the reach of air-launched attacks into environments previously deemed impossible. The Japanese had fortified countless shallow harbors with the confidence that no torpedo bomber could reach them effectively. Now, for the first time, those assumptions were collapsing. The new weapon's debut came without warning. As American bombers approached low over the horizon, Japanese gunners braced for bombs or strafing fire, not the silent menace that followed. From the bellies of the aircraft fell not the gleaming metallic shapes they expected, but slender wooden cylinders painted dull brown, their surfaces glinting faintly under the tropical sun. They hit the water with barely a splash, then accelerated forward, carving white trails toward moored ships and dry dock gates. Within seconds, Explosions rippled across the harbor, throwing geysers of smoke and debris into the air. Dock workers fled as entire sections of shipyards vanished beneath the boiling sea. When divers were later sent to investigate the wrecks, they found no trace of the usual steel fragments. Only scorched fragments of wood floated to the surface, as though the sea itself had devoured the weapon's evidence. For months, 
Japanese engineers could not understand how such a primitive material could unleash such devastating precision. Some theorized that it was a decoy weapon, meant to confuse anti-torpedo nets. Others whispered that it was a kind of secret American camouflage, designed to evade sonar and magnetic sensors. In a way, they were all correct. The wooden casing rendered the torpedo almost invisible to magnetic detection and sonar reflection. The Japanese had designed their harbor defenses around the assumption that torpedoes would trigger metallic sensors. These new ones, made largely of non-metallic materials, slipped through unnoticed. Moreover, their buoyant construction allowed them to operate effectively in waters barely deeper than three meters, perfect for the shallow inlets where Japan had hidden much of its wartime infrastructure. The effect on morale was immediate and profound. Japanese naval intelligence began intercepting panicked communications from coastal defense units reporting phantom torpedoes that appeared in harbors where no submarines could possibly operate. To the defenders, it seemed as if the Americans had found a way to make torpedoes that flew through the air, passed over coral reefs, and then attacked from impossible angles. Even as their scientists eventually deduced the true design, the psychological damage had already been done. Wooden or not, the weapon represented something deeper, a sign that American innovation was adapting faster than Japan could anticipate. The raids on Truk, Rabal, and later on the harbors of the Philippines and Formosa became case studies in what military strategists would later call adaptive warfare. Wooden torpedoes, though limited in production, proved to be an embodiment of American improvisation, a blend of necessity and audacity that defied conventional logic. Each mission refined their design further. Engineers coated them with special resin to resist seawater, experimented with nose cones that optimized surface impact and modified depth-keeping mechanisms to ensure they ran just below the surface. By the end of 1944, these weapons had evolved into something more sophisticated than their humble materials suggested. They had become a symbol of the changing nature of warfare, where ingenuity mattered more than brute strength and where wood could defeat steel. Meanwhile, in the shipyards of Yokosuka, Kure, and Sasebo, the mood shifted from confidence to dread. Reports came in from across the Pacific. Wooden torpedoes had struck supply ships, destroyed floating dry docks, and breached submarine pens that were once thought untouchable. For the first time, Japanese naval planners were forced to divert resources toward reinforcing shallow water defenses. Anti-torpedo nets were redesigned, harbor depths were dredged deeper, and wooden decoys were installed to confuse attackers. The irony was not lost on them. The empire of the rising sun, with all its technological sophistication, was now trying to defend itself from a weapon made of wood. As the war dragged on and the tide turned decisively against Japan, the story of the wooden torpedo became less about destruction and more about symbolism. It represented the ingenuity of an adversary that refused to be confined by the rules of conventional warfare. The weapon itself was never produced in massive quantities but its psychological footprint far exceeded its numerical presence. It proved that innovation was not a matter of resources but of imagination, that even the humblest materials could reshape the battlefield when wielded with insight and daring. When the war finally ended and the smoke cleared from the Pacific skies, the surviving engineers who had once worked in Japan's coastal shipyards began piecing together the fragments of the conflict's technological mysteries. Among them was the question that had haunted them since those early raids. Why would? The answer, they discovered, was both simple and profound. The Americans had not chosen wood out of desperation, but out of understanding. An understanding of physics, geography, and strategy. In the shallow lagoons and coral-ringed harbors of the Pacific, steel was a liability. The ocean floor was the enemy, as much as the ships anchored above it. By crafting a weapon that could ride the delicate line between buoyancy and momentum, the U.S. Navy had turned one of nature's limitations into an advantage. Years later, when captured American documents were studied in post-war Japan, the blueprints of the wooden torpedo revealed their hidden brilliance. Each curve, each layer of laminated timber, had been meticulously calculated to balance weight, lift, and drag. The weapon's wooden shell wasn't merely a cost-saving measure. It was a functional design that interacted with the water's surface in a way steel never could. For those who examined these plans, there was an odd sense of admiration mingled with melancholy. They saw not barbarism, but creativity, 
proof that even in war, the human mind sought elegance in the mechanics of destruction. In the decades that followed, the wooden torpedo faded from public memory, overshadowed by more glamorous innovations like radar, jet engines, and atomic power. But among historians and naval engineers, it remained a quiet testament to the ingenuity of wartime invention. It was a reminder that the outcome of the Pacific War had not been determined by firepower alone, but by adaptability, the ability to see beyond established norms and transform constraints into strengths. And for those who had once feared it, the shipbuilders who watched their harbors erupt in sheets of water and flame, the revelation carried a strange sense of relief. The weapon that had once seemed supernatural was, in the end, profoundly human. It was not a ghost or a curse, but the product of minds that refused to surrender to impossibility. They finally understood why the Americans had dared to use wood in a world of steel. Because the future belonged not to those who built harder, but to those who thought deeper. In the haunting silence that settled over Japan's shipyards after the surrender, with cranes idle and waters calm once more, Fragments of scorched timber sometimes still washed ashore, remnants of those secret weapons that had once terrified an empire. Workers would find them tangled among seaweed and coral, light as driftwood, hollowed by salt and thyme. Some would toss them aside, others would keep them, uncertain why. For in those pieces of wood lay a story greater than the sum of war, a story of how, even amid the fiercest conflict, the spark of human ingenuity can turn the simplest material into a force that changes history. And so the legend of the U.S. Navy's secret wooden torpedoes faded not into oblivion, but into reflection. They were not built to last forever, they were built to prove a point. That in war, as in life, what matters most is not the substance of the weapon, but the mind that wields it. In that truth lay the final irony, the quiet cinematic ending of a weapon made from trees, that wood, once shaped for destruction, would return to the sea not as debris, but as a symbol of imagination, the one resource that no nation could ever exhaust.